Wow, that's amazing. So, thanks for joining me on my ride. That was a paper by Mike Hasselmo's lab where they showed egocentric coding in the retrospinal cortex. Specifically, they show egocentric coding of boundaries in the retrospinal cortex and show cells which have varying vectors from the animal's location representing the boundaries of the room. Um, they do a number of manipulations in figure four to convince you that their observations are true, but before you get to figure four, you're gonna really need to digest figure one because Mike's lab does a really good job of explaining how they digest this data how they parse it and how they classify it so that it gives you a good idea of how to read their egocentric rate maps which are the circular graphs in most of their figures. Um, I really feel as though this correlative study goes a step further simply because figures four and five use manipulation to test hypotheses about how this egocentric coding should react to manipulations in the experience. And I think very, very effectively they show that the rotation doesn't affect the head direction or the sense. Uh, they show that increasing the size doesn't really affect the egocentric coding. And they also show that they fire in novel rooms. Um, so again, it's one of those papers where we're really adding a concrete piece of, a, of the puzzle to our understanding. And I think it's a very unique finding in the sense of putting some better understanding on retrospinal cortex has been a long time coming. Um, he cites a paper from Nitz and Alexander, which showed the first sort of glimpses of the combination of egocentric and allocentric coding in the retrospinal cortex. But I think this paper takes it to obviously a very new level in terms of analysis, figuring out what's going on in the retrospinal cortex. I think this science paper is a big step forward. Um, Michael Hasimov's lab has been famous for acetylcholine work, for medial enterrhinal stuff. What makes his lab really cool is that he's one of the few labs that regularly uses a combination of modeling and physiology to make a point and to test an hypothesis. And so if you're looking for a long track record of extremely solid science, Mike Hasselmo's lab is one of those labs you can definitely count on for that. Furthermore, he has been very successful at training some incredibly young, good young scientists. One that you should check out if you haven't already is Lisa Giacomo at Stanford. She worked for a while with the Mosers in Norway and then started her own group where she's been hitting home runs ever since she landed there. So again, Mike Hasselmo's lab uh, impact on science has been long and sustained. And uh, this paper is just another example of the fact that he's still a heavy hitter. So thanks for the paper, Mike, and uh, congratulations. And if you liked it, like and subscribe to JC on a Bike. See you next time. Good evening, Pittsburgh and Universe. This is JC on a bike. My name is JC and this is Journal Club on a bike. Got another rainy one for you this evening. It is an excellent science paper by the incomparable Mike Hasselmo lab. Mike Hasselmo has mentored a number of the best young scientists that I look up to nowadays in the hippocampal field. And Wow, that's amazing. My castle. Ah, holy man. Sorry about that. <laughs> My castle's lab ah, has has discovered a number of things in the hippocampal circuit over the course of these years. Uh, one of the things that he's known for is cholinergic mechanisms. So much of his, probably his career is dominated by studying acetylcholine and how acetylcholine can activate and modulate circuit function. 
Now, he's done these studies in a number of different places. And in the last, let's say, 10 years, he's done a lot of things in entorhinal cortex, in hippocampus, and done a lot of things with coding. And he's, a, he's one of the first neuroscientists to really combine well the idea of computational modeling and also physiology. I can't believe my voice was destroyed by that dude turning left in front of me. I can't talk anymore. <clears throat> so this is a tricky paper because what we're going to try and look at is ego, ego-centered coding. And the coding that we're typically used to in the brain is most of the time allocentric meaning that it's in the real world relative to other real world things. Place cells, for example, code locations in space in the real world. And where the animal moves doesn't change where that cell seems to encode. Egocentric coding, on the other hand, would be information that is always calculated relative to the position or the whatever the animal is doing. So, <clears throat> egocentric codes are much less rare, are much less common in the brain, at least in terms of what we have been able to discover. Allocentric coding is experimentally more accessible. And that's part of what makes this paper so difficult, is getting your head around what it is they're trying to show you, what it is they've found, and to understand how they're graphically representing it because egocentric coding is a much more difficult nut to crack than allocentric coding simply because allocentric coding tends to be a bit easier to understand in a graphical representation. If an animal cell in the hippocampus only fires in one place in a room then I can show you a picture of that room and put all the spikes in the room and then It'll make sense to you because all the spikes are in one corner and okay, I get it, play cell, none. But the tricky part comes when you try to describe egocentric coding because this coding then will always be relative to the animal. And that makes the analysis a lot harder because if it's always relative to the animal, how are you going to how are we going to parse this data to try and see what cells are doing this? And so in this paper, they're going to try and primarily focus on two egocentric streams of data. The first one is the head direction or movement direction of the animal. And the second one is the relative distance to the boundaries in the maze or the the environment that they're exploring. And so in figure one, they're showing you examples of what these cells look like in the open field. They've developed a very clever way of representing head direction with color so that you can see the head direction of individual of the animal during individual spikes. And then They show you, at the bottom then, three examples of cells that they think show significant spatial tuning to egocentric cues. They show you three different ones, basically. And there, I, I don't really know how to bring all this information into one talk. But there are boundary cells that are found in other parts of the hippocampal system in the cortex. In the entorhinal cortex, there are boundary cells that fire specifically close to boundaries. But they are, again, allocentric coding of boundaries. They are not dependent on the direction the animal's facing or whether the animal is moving in, facing or moving in one direction or not. And so the egocentric cells that they're looking for here and the ones that they're isolating 
from chance with that graph in the upper right corner in figure one. These are cells which show statistically significant correlation to egocentric codes. Head direction or movement direction. And and the distance to the boundaries in the, in the room. And so the idea is, is that there would be a vector that these cells would express which would encode the directionality of a boundary and its relationship to the animal's movement. And so they're looking for cells which encode particular sides, for example, if a boundary is on a particular side, and whether or not a boundary is a particular distance away. And so that's what they see in those three examples. They see a, an animal proximal cell. So that's a cell that fires when the animal is close to a border. An animal distal cell, which fires when the walls are quite far away. And then the last cell type is one that has this inverted firing field where it seems to fire at a, just in the middle of the arena or a certain distance from certain walls. It can even have a directional bias. But So the inverted one is harder to sort of delineate and explain simply because I think this one could also just as easily be, it could just as easily be a boundary vector cell that has a longer a longer run a longer boundary vector and so it's not clear to me all these inverted fields are are really inverted but they are in this preparation and in this size room they are and later on you'll see that they'll try to experiment a little bit with this to see how much of this they can play with in sort of Moser like fashion So I think that's figure one. There's a few more. There's a few more things on the bottom of figure one where they look at like the, if they cluster according to speed or if they cluster according to head direction, whether or not any of their estimates improve, and it's not really that big of a deal. And they also talk about in the in the text that it's very hard to divorce or to differentiate between cells that are influenced by movement direction versus cells that are influenced by head direction even though these two variables, technically speaking, from an egocentric perspective are different, because they are kind of interdependent variables, they decided to pool all these cells together. So not all the cells code head direction, not all the cells encode movement direction, but there are cells that encode movement direction apart from head direction, and there are cells that encode head direction apart from movement. And then I presume, although I didn't necessarily read that, that there are cells that are harder to disambiguate whether or not they're purely head direction or purely movement speed combined with boundary vector firing. So in figure two, what they're going to show you, I believe, is how they're going to analyze this data relative to the center of, the, of where the spike hits. Yeah, so figure two is going to compute is going to compute <coughs> show you how they're going to compute this. So if you look first at D, that's really the where this figure starts. D shows you four the four steps in terms of coming up with the egocentric vector rate map, which is the round the round map uh, the round map at the far right the round map with the blue and the yellow shading. What that is showing you is the egocentric code. And again, the egocentric code is in a circle because it's relative to the animal which is in the center of the circle. That was not how you would display a place cell or a grid cell because they're not egocentric codes, they're allocentric. So with this one, what they do is they look at the spike map and then for each spike, they correlate that spike or register that spike as having a head direction and then having distances to the boundaries 
and they only map to the boundaries that are closer than halfway across that's why they use 65.5 centimeters there's no reason to map all the way across they only map to the closest they only map to the closest walls and then they make the ray map which is the circular thing which describes relative to the front the left and the right and the back where this cell fires that's the yellow shading So that's, uh, nice, that's how they determine the cells that are doing it. And they determine what are, what the cells are coding. Figure two is gonna try and sort through some of the details of this coating. So what they're going to do is they're going to try and make a map of the animal's behavior in an open field. That's the first panel of this figure. And convert it to a map where each spike followed by the next spike is mapped to see how far the animal moves and what direction he moves. And the angular displacement try and make these long vertical maps where they display X displacement and Y displacement in the XY and in the middle his direction and so what you can see is that they're analyzing all the retrospinal cells to see what percentage of them are biased to a particular direction and a particular movement speed or displacement and quantifying that in terms of a self-motion signal. Some of them have a big self-motion signal, some of them don't. And so then at the bottom of this figure, they show you examples of two egocentric boundary cells, one with a very high self-motion dependence and another one with a very low self-motion dependence. Just to kind of give you an idea of the palette of cells that they discovered in retrospinal, the palette of firing patterns and the palette of correlated firing that they find in retrospinal. So figure three then is going to try and explain this using various variables taken from the experiment. Those variables are all displayed on the left. And they're categories, categorized based on whether they're allocentric, whether they're egocentric. And what they're going to do then is try to use a generalized linear model to explain the data and then remove different parts of the linear data, or sorry, this linear model representing these different parts on the left to see which one of those parts makes the model file part. And essentially the only part that makes the model fall apart of the, are the egocentric boundary cell variables, the head direction and the distance from the walls. And if they mess with the, the model predictions with the allocentric cues or the, I don't know what the other one is, environmental or something, I, there's two that they mess with that don't really have an effect on the model's output, but messing with the egocentric cues completely blows the model's ability to predict the data. And I like this. I like this a lot. Um, obviously, it's not causation, but I still like the result. And Ann Churchland did the same thing in her paper, but she correlated to a video. And the video ended up being able to explain everything that she saw. So that's quite a bit different than coding to a specific thing like what's happening in the environment or where they are in the environment and how far away they are from walls that's a much more concrete correlation it's still a correlation but it's not quite the same correlation as cells firing when you touch or touch the handle or make a choice but it is still correlation <laughs> 
Okay, so here's where the paper gets cool, cooler even. Because in figure four, they're going to start playing with this stuff to see if they're right. And there are some, wow, look at this idiot. There are some predictions that one could make if these are really egocentric boundary cells. The first one is they put the animal in a square room, characterize the cells, and then rotate the square room 45 degrees. If it's egocentric, the directions in the room stay the same, therefore head direction stays the same. You see that there. Cells in the CA3 region cells in entorhinal cortex would have rotated 45 degrees with the boundaries. These cells did not. That's a big finding. That's a real big finding. There's another one here where they expand the walls so they have them in a certain size room and then they move the room make it a bigger room and again the egocentric cell fires basically the same because making the room bigger doesn't change the animals coordinates at all and the final observation i think is pretty cool is that they look at the animal in a big open field with no walls and what they see is that the animal distal cells are still firing but the animal proximal cells their firing is pattern is completely destroyed when you remove the walls great result and then finally they show in figure six that a good proportion of these cells are theta modulated. Which means they can contribute to online hippocampal cycling when the animal's replaying or pre-playing possible futures or random paths. Super cool paper. Congratulations, Professor Hasselmo. I think he knows I'm kind of a fanboy of his. I've been a fanboy of his since I was doing nicotinic receptors for my PhD. And he's always been the consummate gentleman. Last year I asked him for his slides from his SFN talk and he sent them to me within an hour and asked me if I had any feedback I should let him know ha! hilarious feedback from Mike Hasselmo I don't know don't let anybody get in your way 